Oh, I'm doing so good. It's so good to see you. It's great to see you. Yeah. So you were just telling me, uh, you know, before we got started today that um, you're sort of on the road to recovery right now. After yeah, the, uh, I've been basically uh, bedridden for over five months. Uh, I know. It's really, um, and, and literally I would broken some bones in both feet, so I literally couldn't walk or get out of bed or move around and that's a very weird feeling to just be bedridden i mean you just can't get up um and so of course i have to sit there and meditate you know pretty much 24 7 um and that was um and that was that part was fun but it was in terms of just my gross body um it was just a lot of pain and it was bored senseless as a lousy combination. <laughs> yeah. um, but so I would just sit and, and flop into uh, non-dual awareness and, 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 and just um, float on downstream. Uh, so I, I, I've done that for months. Um, and it's finally, um, it's more or less healed up. Uh, so I have uh, actually just day before yesterday took the so-called air casts, which are these casts that you put on around your legs and feet, and then they pump them up with the air so it holds them very tight. And that's what you leave on 24 hours a day. Uh, and so those finally came off. Um, and I'm uh, slowly getting functional again. Well, I'm glad to hear it, man. When I, yeah. when I imagine you five months in bed, I mean, yeah, I imagine um, lots of meditation and lots of uh, Netflix marathons. Is, That's about it. I imagine was your reality for the last five years or five yeah. months. Yeah. Well, it's, it's so good. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that you're recovering and you're doing well. Great. Um, yeah. And it's great um, that we can start this show again because we've taken a few months off and um, boy, we have a big topic uh, to talk about today, a really yeah. timely topic, I think, because um, yep. today we're going to be talking about shadow, um, yep. and we're, we're going to be discussing sort of the history of shadow, uh, the different kinds of shadow, yep. and really how to work with our own individual and collective shadows, really in all four quadrants, which I think is right. going to be a really uh, fascinating conversation for us. Um, and I really, again, I can't think of a better time for us to have this conversation, Ken. There's just such a massive shadow looming over i mean seemingly the entire world right now yeah. and all of us are you know sort of standing in its shade to you know some extent um it seems to me anyway that our culture wars are being driven these days as much by shadow uh, as they are by sort of the different values coming out of these different altitudes and now it's reached this you know sort of fever pitch that i think we usually associate with things like full-blown civil war yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's sort of our job as integralists to begin stepping into those gaps and doing what we can to, you know, kind of pull people back from the ledge, you know, and give them hopefully a few more tools to help them, you know, both confront and integrate their own shadow material. Right. Um, you know. Sort of one of the fundamental definitions of shadow is material that actually belongs to you, but you don't know it belongs to you. That's right. So one of the most common things you tend to do with shadow material is project it. It's like, you know, somebody has a whole lot of anger, a whole lot of aggression, or a whole lot of jealousy, or a whole lot of bitterness. But since it can't be you, it must be somebody else, anybody. It's, yeah, it's definitely not me, Ken. Come on. I'm... And so you really do end up shadow boxing or, or shadow hugging. And that's an um, enormous problem, certainly in your own individual life, but also in collective life. As a matter of fact, we'll see that there are, of course, shadow elements from all four quadrants or all eight zones, if you want to um, look at it in more detail. Mm. So we'll be going over all of that. And, um, of course, um, I've written about all of this in a lot of detail, and people can pick that up. But we'll at least give some... Um, introductory overviews to kind of orient people to the to the topic in general 
And so people can hopefully get a sense of what's happening when they're dealing with shadow material. Yeah. Um, and everybody is to one degree or another. Um, and it's also, it's, it's an extremely important area because it means it's one of the um, most important routes to self-knowledge. Um, I mean, you really have to, in order to know yourself, you have to know everything that's actually in yourself, everything that's part of you, the kind of qualities, characteristics, impulses, dispositions that you have. And if you're not aware of those, then you really are ignorant of your own self and, mm -hmm. and what it is and what it's made of, basically. And so it's a really crucial uh, an important area and it's the easiest way for people to kid themselves to basically lie to themselves about who and what they really are we all get caught in that to some degree but it's it's a very very problematic area when that happens so we're going to go through that a little bit and give people a sense about what that is why it happens and what you can do about it beautiful yeah yeah, hundred percent. And you know, and oftentimes, Ken, when we're talking about just the integral approach in general, we often use the shorthand of growing up, waking up, cleaning up, which is shadow work, and showing up. And sort of, I, you know, my visual hit whenever I sort of go through that gestalt is, you know, growing up is all about making our egos, our self concept, as really big as we can. I mean, with every sort of step of the growing up sequence, our egos are getting bigger, more complex, more capable. Right. every step of the way. And then the process of waking up is about making that big ego as transparent to ourselves as possible and transparent to sort of the absolute as possible. And then cleaning up is about getting as much of that self-concept in front of our faces as possible, right? So there's no lingering sort of unknowns back here that we're not tracking and are actually sort of sabotaging um, our our efforts in the world and our, our beliefs and our relationships and all of that. Um, so all three of these really, really do, um, you know, th there's, there's, they hang together in such sort of, uh, you know, really, really important ways. Right. And it's, it's difficult to talk about really any of these. It's a classic integral problem, right? You can't talk about one of these without talking about all of these. Right. Um, but that's, that's one of the reasons I'm excited to have this conversation today is because we're going to be doing exactly that. We're going to be looking at the history of shadow. We're going to be looking at the different kinds of shadow and we're going to be looking at how this actually shows up in all of these different quadrants. Right. Um, and, you know, I tell you, Ken, if we could just sort of figure out how to actually like harness, <laughs> tap into the energy of our shadows. I yep. mean, it feels like this infinitely renewable energy that we could like fly airplanes and run power plants off of. There's just yeah, so, it is. Yeah, is there's, there's so much important um, source of um, access to a whole energy, a whole component of ourselves, both also a certain type of information about ourselves and a certain type of energy that's driving. It. And all of those can get submerged. All of those we can become unaware of. And it's important because we talk about, well, uh, integral has a lot of parts, but at a minimum, we usually talk about quadrants and levels and lines and states and types. Mm -hmm. And including all quadrants, we call showing up, including all levels, we call growing up, including all lines, we call opening up. And one of the lines includes defense mechanisms. So that includes shadow material and that's cleaning up. Mm. And then including all states we call waking up. So this really is, um, including shadow material, is getting in touch with any of those areas that we have in us, active and available, but that we're unaware of. And that's what causes the problems. And so in terms of an actual therapeutic process, a, a cleaning up, because the whole point about the shadow is it is unconscious, it, it's very, very hard to spot. And as a matter of fact, we really didn't spot, well, there are a couple of all those areas, some of them like waking up, go back several thousand years. And so some of the, um, earliest 
um, examples of people having a real satori, uh, which is what Zen calls enlightenment or awakening. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, mo the more slightly more frequent term in Zen is a Kensho, a K-E-N-S-H-O, which is Sounds what familiar. we also mean by the Kensho. <laughs> But K-E-N in Japanese means true nature, and Sho, S-H-O, means seeing into. So Satori is a seeing into one's true nature. And that's a first person direct immediate experience. And again, that goes back probably at least um, three, maybe 4,000 years. If you count shamanic versions of it, it's back about 10,000 years. But when it came to actual shadow material, the type of stuff that Freud and Jung and Adler and Fritz Perls would deal with, though that really wasn't discovered until about 100 years ago. Hmm. And it's the same with the actual stages of growing up. We had no idea those were there until about 100 years ago. So you can get a very powerful spiritual practice and be doing meditation and working with mindfulness and so on and that will help you work with states of consciousness and waking up but it won't show you the stages of growing up and it won't show you shadow mm. material so that's why we want to include cleaning up and growing up along with any practice of waking up if we're really going to be integral so these are important areas and they're also for knowledge that the human race has of itself, actually most forms of shadow material really weren't discovered clearly until about a hundred years ago. Freud's first book after all was written in 1895. So that's not too long ago in right. the scheme of things. So we'll see where that gets us. Right. No, beautiful. And thanks for launching that uh, sort of into our first topic, which is exactly that. It's the history of the shadow. Um, and one of the questions I had for you is whether you could talk about how the concept of the psychological shadow actually first emerged in sure. Freud and Jung's work. Sort of what were the, the critical insights that they made um, that, you know, allowed us to actually suddenly see this, uh, this psychological phenomenon that, as you say, has been with us from the beginning of history, but right. we didn't really have a way to, um, you know, to, to see at, or even work with right. uh, adequately. That's um, right. So how did that first emerge in their, in their work? And then how has the concept of shadow actually evolved over the last hundred or so years? Right. And how does your approach to shadow differ from these sort of earlier versions? Right. Um, so if we're just looking at types of, of consciousness or areas of consciousness that could be unconscious, there's at least two different areas that that can happen. As usual, there are ultimate states and there are relative states. And ultimate states are essentially, particularly the very highest of ultimate states, are said to be ever-present. They're said to be timeless, which just means ever-present. It doesn't mean lasting forever. That's everlasting time. But eternity means timeless, it means a moment without time. So as even Wittgenstein himself put it, if we take eternity to mean not everlasting temporal duration, but a moment without time, then eternal life belongs to those who live in the present. And that's exactly right. The timeless now the eternal now is fully present right now. And but many people aren't aware of that, even though technically it's the only thing we're ever aware of. So as I often give quick examples, um, in the relative world, there is sort of relative time. But ultimately, that's not what you're aware of. I mean, if you, we think that there's the past and the present and the future. But if you think of something from the past, and actually, all there is is a timeless now, and that's all we're ever aware of. So you can think of something from your past, get a really clear image of it, see it really clearly, get a good sense of it. But notice all you're really aware of when you do that is you're aware of a present memory. And that memory is existing right now. And when the event actually happened, it occurred right now. The only thing you're really aware of is a right now moment. 
And the same goes with the future. You can think of some future event that might happen, but that itself is also just a present image, a present thought. And when it actually happens, it will be a present now moment. So the only thing you're ever actually aware of is a present now moment. And that's why Wittgenstein would say, if we take eternity, timeless now, to mean not everlasting temporal duration, but a moment without time, then eternal life belongs to those who live in the present. So it's a bit of a paradox. We call it the paradox of instruction because what it means is you don't have to get in touch with eternal now. That's all you're ever in touch with. But most people don't realize that. So in other words, you need a Satori in order to realize you don't need Satori. So that play is a little bit of a play on that, but there is a certain sense then in which our true nature, our can that we're gonna get insight into or show, that's ever present, that's timeless, that's fully present. But again, most people don't realize that. And the actual direct realization of that is known as enlightenment or awakening. And so in a certain sense, that enlightened mind, which is the mind that's fully present of the ever present eternal now, which is all we're ever really aware of. Um, but that eternal mind, that eternal consciousness is, is in that sense unconscious. People aren't aware of it. And so becoming aware of that, which again is a first person, direct, immediate experience, that was known as enlightenment. And in a certain sense, that was humanity's first understanding that there could be aspects of their awareness that were profound and deep, but that they weren't aware of. But they could become aware of them, and that was a very important event. Now, what was they were becoming aware of was this ultimate unity consciousness. What people weren't aware of, starting that far back anyway, was indeed the relative shadow or the relative mind. And what that means is there are certain aspects of your own individual relative self. Now this would mean technically your illusory self. But even the traditions recognize that emptiness is not other than form, form is not other than emptiness. So the ultimate self is one with the relative self. It expresses itself through the relative self. And so we really, want to be in touch with both our relative self and our true self, our ultimate self, because both of them have a certain type of reality. Now, the problem with the relative self is because it's made of uh, images, desires, impulses, drives, needs, those are all relative events. And what we would find out several thousand years later is that any of those relative phenomena, relative drives, relative needs, relative desires, those could be present, but we could be unaware of them. So just like the enlightened mind that could be present, and yet we, we didn't quite realize it. So the relative mind, the often called the ego, the relative self, it could have impulses or drives that were fully part of it, but that it wasn't aware of. And what, as we pushed into those relative shadows, what we would start to find is that there are also, it wasn't just that we could not be aware of some of these shadow elements, it's that we could be actively pushing them out of awareness. Mm -hmm. They were too threatening. We were too judgmental about them. We didn't wanna possess these things. Typically things like sex and aggression, we tended to have trouble with those in part because culture itself would tend to be judgmental and say, oh, you don't, you can't have that sexual drive. That's, that's dirty, that's nasty. And so we would tend to push that out of awareness. And so that is what became known as the 
psychodynamic shadow. Mm. And it was called that because although there was a lot of research that started to be done on this about 150 years ago, the name we associate with relative shadow material and its repression or dissociation is, of course, Sigmund Freud. But notice that Freud, Freud wrote his first book um, in 1895. So it's really just a little over 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was actually researching it and started writing that material. And this was when he was quite, um, quite late in his, in his own life. I think he was in his 40s or 50s when he, when he wrote that. Um, but he started, uh, he was a, technically a psychiatrist, a, a medical doctor at that, at that time. And he started to notice that people had various qualities, various characteristics, various drives, various desires, and he could see that they possessed them. And they would tend to react to people that possess them, but they wouldn't know that they themselves were possessing them. And so as he pushed down into what that personal unconscious material could be, he went through three major phases determined by what he thought these ultimate unconscious drives were. And his first version was food and sex. Food kept you alive. Sex kept the species alive. So there was a conflict between those two. And Freud traced all neurotic conflict to the conflict between those two instincts. That didn't quite work. And so in his second phase, he switched them to sex and aggression. Mm. And that's mostly what he's most known for. And even most psychoanalytic psychiatrists today tend to use sex and aggression as being sort of the two main instinctual drives. And they, they can get in conflict sex wants to move towards something and incorporate it. Aggression wants to move against it and destroy it. So these are already at conflict. And if they become in conflict within the individual, then that conflict is going to cause various types of neurotic problems. That's neuroses. The term neuroses was invented by Otto Rock, hmm. who was one of Freud's initial inner circle. His inner circle included Carl Jung, Alfred Adler, Otto Rank. These guys were all geniuses, literally geniuses. And they were all together, stimulated largely by Freud's first book, The Interpretation of Dreams. And so they had come together and were starting to do all of this research. Otto Rank um, invented the term neurosis. He also... Um, was the one that first introduced birth trauma and believed that um, most neuroses could be traced to um, the trauma of, of birth. Um, so we'll get into a little bit later exactly what Freud was doing. I'll mention it a little bit now, I've talked about it before, but most people don't know this about Freud. And that is we, hear the so-called Freudian terms like ego and id, mm -hmm. but the fact is Freud himself never used the word ego or id, ever. Those terms were put in his work by his official translator, James Strachey. And Strachey did it because these are Latin terms and he thought it made Freud sound more scientific <laughs> if, he, if, he, if he used those terms. What Freud actually wrote was the German for the it and the I. And that's what he would actually write. So he would say, for example, if we look within our mind, we see one area that's under our control. This is the I. It, it submits to our will. It's under our conscious control. We're pretty much aware of that. And, and it is our I. And that's what he would call it, the I, not the ego, the I. And he would just write it that way, the I. And then he said, and then in addition to the I, 
we find a broad, dark, deep area called the it. And the it is not under our control. So we'll say things like the hunger, it overcame me. The fear, it's stronger than I am. The anxiety, it overcomes me. So Freud was asked, what is, in one sentence, what's the goal of psychoanalysis? And Freud said, oh, where it was, there I shall become. Now, what he really said was, where it was, there I shall become. Not where it was, their ego shall become, right. but where it was, there I shall become. <laughs> and that's exactly what he meant. A first person experience or a quality that belongs to us, we first turn it into a second person and push it on the other side of our awareness. And then we turn that, if necessary, into a third person. So in the second person, for example, I'm not angry, but you are. So I'm projecting my anger onto you. So I turn it from an I to a you. And then if that's still too close, then I can just project it and say, oh, you or I don't have anger, but they do, or he does, or she does. So project it into a third person. So it goes from first person to second person to third person. Each case, you're shoving it farther and farther and farther away. So Freud just wanted to reverse that process and take it back from third to second to first. This is what Brilliant. we call the three, two, one process. And we'll get to that uh, in a bit. A lot of people know what that is. Um, but that was the whole real beginning of present day psychotherapy. Hmm. And even though not many people today consider themselves to be strict Freudians, his general attempt of understanding how we can take something that belongs to us, belongs to our I, is, is an I, a me, a mine, and then shove it into a you, and shove it into a he, she, they, them, or shove it all the way over into an it, just a completely dissociated it. And that what we have to do is reown the stuff that we're denying. So often people will see a therapist because they're depressed and they'll just, the depression is completely an it to them. They'll say, I can't control it. It's overwhelming. Uh, it makes me feel so sad. All it, 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 all third person terms with no understanding of how the drives present in the depression are actually part of your own eye, your own awareness, if you can re-own it. So this was Freud's initial breakthrough. And this is what really opened the field up for the first time in, in human history. It was a big one. So, yeah. And uh, I mentioned that Carl Jung was one of his inner circle. And in fact, Freud had already announced that Carl Jung was, and these were Freud's terms, my crown prince and successor. He had completely selected Jung as the successor to Freud. And they proceeded uh, and, and got along very well. But increasingly, Jung was looking into mystical schools and spiritual practices and these were things that Freud thought were more indicative of regression to infantile mm -hmm. oceanic feelings. And they finally got in, in, in a very, very testy argument at one point. And Freud finally said, promise me you will keep the libido theory to protect us. And Jung said, well, protect us from what? And Freud said, from the black mud of the black tide of occultism. <laughs> and Jung very dryly in his autobiography comments, what Freud didn't know is occultism is everything I found interesting. And they literally never spoke again after that discussion. They never oh. said a single word to each other for the rest of their lives. And Jung went his way, Freud went his way. Freud finally changed 
to his third set of instincts, which he called eros and thanatos, life and death. Now, what, what Freud was doing, he was a bright boy, even though limited, is he had actually found eros, which is the, the using essentially the same way we did, is the developmental drive towards greater union and wholeness. That's what eros is. The eros in its pathological form is you're not just transcending something or, or, or transcending and including it, you're moving away from it, you're repressing it, you have, you're afraid of it. So eros degenerates into phobos. And phobos is part of a repressive drive. Phobos is something that will repress a quality because it's, it's trying to deny it, basically. Um, but then the other drive for the, among the four drives of holons, we have agency and communion on the same level and then eros and agape, the vertical drives. And agape is the drive to reach down and embrace and enfold. And when it goes pathological, it doesn't just reach down, it actually moves down, it regresses. Mm -hmm. And the end limit of regression is all the way to insentient matter or thanatos, death. So Freud got the two drives, but he gave the healthy version of Eros and he gave the pathological version of Agape. But, but he was on to them. But He's that's a politician. Jung basically had split his overall um, therapeutic pathway into three major phases. The first was dealing with persona. And the persona is the one that technically has shadow in a narrow sense. And for Jung, this is not very well known, but for Jung, the persona itself is shadow of the same sex material. And so that's what you do when you work with the persona shadow level. You're trying to find material. If you're a male, you're looking for masculine traits that you've dissociated or repressed and projected. And if you're female, you're looking for female traits that you've repressed, dissociated, projected. The second phase of Jungian therapy, it works with anima and animus. And this is where the person works with the contrasexual drives in themselves. So if you're a man, you work with your anima, the female qualities that you have but are unaware of. And if you're female, you work with the animus, the male aspects, and you have to integrate those. Virtually all psychotherapeutic practices involve a, a, a reintegration of material that's been split off or repressed or dissociated. So after you finish working with your anima and animus, then you find yourself moving into the transpersonal or archetypal phase of Jungian therapy. And there you start to work with collective material. You can get into mystical states, states of ultimate unity, consciousness, and so on. And so that's a sort of a, a brief summary of a broad um, sort of Jungian approach. Stan Groff, who um, is still alive and is still um, working. Groff is probably, he's from Czechoslovakia. He moved um, to America in, uh, I think, uh, 60s. And he's probably the person that's done more research on psychedelic drugs and therapy than anybody else in the world. And he found that people went through three phases when they were doing psychedelic, if they were just taking them themselves, let alone if they were doing psychedelic therapy. And he called them Freudian, Rankian, Jungian, or first of all, personal shadow material. And you work through that. And then if you do that, then you get down into more existential material. And Groff believed, following Otto Rank, 
that the existential material all represented various aspects of the birth trauma. And so I've acknowledged the possibility of that. And if so, I call it fulcrum zero. But I believe a lot of existential issues aren't just or can't just be reduced to phases in the birth trauma. Um, existential is much too sophisticated and complex to be experienced by um, an infant being born. Um, but it can happen, and that is there. And then as you push through that existential or Rankian level, then you bust into the Jungian or transpersonal level, and there are more mystical experiences and satori's and so on that can start to um, occur. So what basically for me shadow material in the broadest sense is just any material that we are unaware of that's actually a part of our own makeup. And so often that can be repressed, it can be dissociated. If you look at um, many psychiatric models um, of therapy and development today, they have a hierarchy of defense mechanisms that actually fit in with the hierarchy of psychological development. And so when the self system is first forming and there's a boundary is just starting to form between the subjective self and the exterior environment, then the boundary between self and other is just being deposited. And so this is where we tend to have the earliest defense mechanisms tend to be projection or interjection. So here, because the boundary is so fluid, you can internalize stuff from the exterior world very, very easily. And it's very common to introject parental judgments or um, parental um, negatives, parental um, repressions or dissociations. And so that can be a problem. And then also because the boundary is very loose, you can take material that belongs on the inside of the self and you can shove it to the other side of the boundary and that's projection. So those are technically some of the very earliest defense mechanisms. In integral, we use interjection and projection for those earliest, but we also see them as, as very much a generalized type of defense mechanism that can occur at virtually any level of development. Mm. So you can have material at the magenta stage that you can interject or project. At the red stage, you can project red material. At the amber stage, you can interject or project amber material. And essentially almost all the way up the spectrum of growing up, you can also do it with states and waking up. So projection and interjection is a very, very broad defense mechanism that we use. And because the three, two, one process works with taking back projected material from a third person to a second person back to the first person where you reown it, then the three, two, one process is very good as just a very generalized practice that will work with most defense mechanisms and at most levels of um, consciousness. And so it's, it's often we'll just present the three, two, one process as the single therapeutic process we're working with. It's just an introductory process mm -hmm. because it is so simple and so very broad reaching. And um, we, can, we, we'll, we can come back to that um, a little bit more as we go through. Um, but in the broadest sense, and if we're just still looking at the upper left quadrant, you can have shadow material in the process of growing up, in the process of waking up, in the process of different developmental lines or multiple intelligences. You can develop shadow in any of those. 
and contacting all of our multiple intelligences we call opening up um, and then in, can occur to states of consciousness in waking up. So these are, um, the 3 2, one process has that sort of broad outreach and shadow material can occur in all of these different processes, waking up, growing up, showing up, um, opening up. Mm. Um, and what we find, of course, typically is that as the case with most aspects of integral, different disciplines in the orthodox field will select just one or two of them as being real and focus on those. So there are ones that will focus on opening up, ones that will focus on growing up, ones that will focus on showing up and so on. And we'll go through uh, some of those and how those can, uh, uh, can occur um, as well. Um, so what we'll see as we go through it is um, that there is shadow material in each of the four quadrants. There's shadow material in each of the major levels of development. There's shadow material in each of the major lines of development. There's shadow material in each of the major states of consciousness as well. And there are different types of therapeutic processes that have been developed to handle each of those. And even though that can start to sound complex, we can also just simplify as well. That's why we say you just usually just start with a three, two, one process, and that'll do an enormous amount of work. But then you can still go into more detail, and you can also look up specific types of therapeutic processes that are now out there and are available. And somebody will be specializing in working with transactional analysis or gestalt therapy or bioenergetics. And each of those is focusing on a different one of these areas. A complete integral approach, of course, is at least aware of all of those. And you can use as many of them uh, as you want, but it at least helps to be aware of them. So what we have is aspects of our own being, our own being, consciousness, awareness. And even though those aspects can belong to us, we can lose track of them. We can actually just simply lose track of them. We can also dissociate them. We can deny them. We can repress them. We can shove them out of awareness. And those are basically defense mechanisms that do that. And all defense mechanisms take some quality or characteristic in awareness and because it finds them threatening or because it's judged them or because it's not supposed to have those kinds of impulses or desires, it can dissociate and push it out of awareness. And the only problem with defense mechanisms is they don't really work. And so unfortunately, defense mechanisms bring about that which they were meant to ward off. Right. And so it's like, oops, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, so what happens when you project one of your qualities, when you defend against it, deny it's yours, and maybe project it onto somebody else, is it then changes its quality and becomes a symptom, usually a very painful symptom. So if I have um, a type of aggression and, and maybe I feel an aggression towards you and I project that aggression, uh, now I'm free of aggression, but now you're mad at me for some reason that I don't understand. Um, or if I'm very controlling and I project that onto my boss, then I find my boss is always trying to control me and is always criticizing me and so on. That's a typical projection, and it's actually changed the nature of the shadow material. Usually, if it's, if it's positive, it'll make it negative, and if it's negative, it'll make it even more negative. So it, 
it doesn't work is the point. I mean, if, if you could really just say, oh, I'm denying that I have this drive or need or desire, and it worked, then that would be fine. You could just go around denying all the crap that, that you didn't like. But unfortunately, it doesn't. And that's the problem. Um, it seems so to imply fine. that there is some real poetry in the universe, Ken. That's <laughs> absolutely. Um, so that's a brief um, introduction. Shadow material research and work with that has continued to move forward. Uh, when we talk about shadow in the quadrants, we'll talk about the place where most shadow work is going on now is looking at brain centers and brain processes. Mm. So it'll look at the reptilian brain stem and, and of course drives that come with the reptilian brain stem like food and certain aggression. In the limbic system, paleomammalian has certain primitive feel, <laughs> feelings and emotions. And so, and then of course the um, cortex has sort of the chimpanzee brain. What we find we have in the human brain is a lizard, a horse, a chimpanzee, and a human. And those are actually all operating in the upper right quadrant. And that's where most work is being done now because you can do that with brain imaging. And that's easier than having to just listen to free association process. And then the therapist tries to deduce, okay, is that reptilian? Is that mammalian? Is that chimpanzee? Where is that impulse coming from? Um, so we'll see that there's just a lot of work done with, with um, tracking brain states. And then the major form of therapy in the left hand, upper left, when you projected something, repressed and projected it, then you need to do stuff like the three, two, one process or some form of talk therapy. But in the upper right, what, because it's just material processes going on, the most common treatment there is simply medication. Mm. So psychiatrists today, for example, are often taught nothing but how to handle medication. And they'll just have what's called a 15 minute meds check. So once every month or two, the patient will come in, talk to the psychiatrist, tell them how the medication is working that they've gotten for their anxiety or their obsessive compulsive disorder or their depression or so on. Those are all now mostly treated with drugs and there's not that much talk therapy done in actual psychiatry. For that, you do have to go to a psychotherapist who will try and actually help you integrate these drives in the upper left quadrant and not just douse them with drugs in the mm -hmm. upper right quadrant. But there's room for both, clearly. Mm -hmm. So we'll, um, we can get to that. 